afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to see many of you over here. That's actually great, especially after yesterday's social event. So I'm very glad to see that. Now, uh, first of all, before anything, I would like to extend my utmost gratitude to DEF CONF organizers, volunteers, sponsors alike for making this possible and providing us with this platform in which we get to share our know-how. Now, today's topic will actually be about well, a new way to init subclass. But before we even get into that, um, who is it that's going to even give this? Who am I? So we're going to go with the who am I section. Um, so feel free to go with the terminal way of getting to know me, or I'm going to go ahead and say it. My name is Faisal Reyes. I'm from Jordan. And I have studied mechanical engineering with a specialization of IT and automation in a Czech Technical University in Prague. I love Latin dancing, I love psychology, financial markets, so I hope this puts some kind of personality behind who's going to give the talk. Now, actually, before we even get to that, I would like to have some idea about the crowd over here. So I'm going to ask a few simple questions just to get a rough idea here. How many of you have ever like programmed anything with Python before? Oh, great. Many people. That's amazing. How many of you know what a class is and how it's initialized? Great. So far, so good. And how many of you know what new is, Dunder new or magic method new? All right. Nice. And in its subclass? Cool. Much fewer hands than the first two questions. So that means we're on the right track, at least. Now, also before anything, it's good to ask yourself, why are you here? What kind of value can you extract out of this? Who is this targeted for? So. I would actually boil it down to two core concepts. First one is that, well, the new and init subclass, not many people tend to deal with those or know about those. So they can actually serve as an extra tool in your toolbox whenever you're trying to look up for solutions. But I would say the other one, the second one, is more important, which is that it actually bridges betw uh, between the everyday programming and metaprogramming. So usually metaprogramming is this intimidating zone where like, the program's input is another program and so on and so forth. No one wants to deal with that. But we all have the everyday programming, the classes, the typical structure of code that we usually do. So I really want this talk to serve as the bridge between that, to kind of give you the courage to move on to um, understanding metaprogramming concepts. So let's go through the agenda of today. Um, this is the sequence, just so that you will be on track of what's happening. First of all, we're going to have a problem statement, some task. And from there, we will have a solution to that task. I'm categorizing it as hell, because it's not super nice, but well, a solution nonetheless. And then we're going to make that slightly better. And I think it's kind of the common way of how this problem is solved. We'll see all of this later. Then we're going to actually introduce new and init subclass, see what they do, how they work, more or less. And then finally, try to implement them into the solution and potentially to make things uh, better or more interesting. So the problem statement. So as we all know, there are so many file types, so many files that exist out there. We've got HTML files, CSV files, TXT files, PI files, so on and so forth. They're just countless. But I would like to take the idea from it, the, take an abstraction over this, which is what do files serve as? They store information in a particular way. They store it in a particular format. So with HTML files, for example, you've got the greater than and less than to kind of uh, put the structure of the file. You've got CSV files where it's comma separated to know the different columns, and uh, so on and so forth. But the idea is still the same. We have some information that we would like to extract. So the problem statement will actually be uh, about loading the file. We're not thinking about how we put the information into the files. We're just thinking about how to load that information. That will actually take us to the live demo. So let's take a look at this problem statement and how we could deal with this. So. Great, we could see this. So I'm using Tmux just to kind of lay out the same agenda at the very top, so you can see where we are. At first, we'll actually be looking at the task. As I said, we will be dealing with loading files. So first of all, the, all the files, as you see over here, are having the same exact content, hello and then code. I'm not trying to make here a talk about exactly how to parse HTML files or so on. So take the abstract idea. The goal is to kind of load this file by replacing the word code in, cap uh, in capital letters with the actual file extension. This will simulate loading a file. Now let's go to the first solution. Um, 
here we are. Now this is the, let's say, the code base or the mini code base structure. Let's get familiarized a bit with it. Very simple. We've got actually the laser pointer would serve good for this. <laughs> We've got um, the application, the py, which will be our entry point, let's say. It's what we will run. Think of it as main.c. Um, and then you've got a directory called loaders, which, as you would guess, <laughs> holds a bunch of loaders. So we've got a bunch of py files um, implementing a CSV loader, defconf loader, x1 loader. The point is that it doesn't matter what file it is, but we need to know what logic must we implement to load this file. So um, maybe let's take a look at the CSV loader, just to have an, a rough idea about it. The rest of them are structured exactly the same way. So we have the class, CSV loader. It inherits from some interface. It just requires a load method. And this load method requires the file location or path, and then it loads it. So this area over here will be the logic in which you parse and read and try to load the data. Over here, we're simply opening the file, and then we are replacing the word code with, I am inside a CSV file. So that will simulate that we actually loaded this file successfully. So the rest will be exactly the same. Um, and now let's take a look at the application. This will be the interesting part. Um, so we import a bunch of stuff. We import the loaders, the base class, and so on. But let's see what happens here in, in the main. We've got, some, we've got the file path. It doesn't matter what, where the location is. It's just the path of the file. But what's interesting um, is over here, we get the extension of the file by using the path and actually getting the suffixes of it. So that's how we know it's .csv, .html, .whatever it is. And then <laughs> we would like to initialize some loader. But how would we initialize it? We need to check for the extension. So if extension is CSV, the loader is going to be CSV loader. That's when we initialize it. LF, ext1, LF, devconf, LF, LF, LF. And that's the LF help, right? Um, definitely, we wouldn't want to do that, but hey, it works. So if, if we were to even like run this, right now we have the CSV file not commented out, so uh, we could simply run this code, and we would see that, yeah, it, it loaded it successfully. It loaded whatever. This is the path to the file. And it says, hello, I am inside a .csv file. So it was loaded properly. It didn't have just the code. But yeah, great, this, is, this works. How do we make this somehow better? And the common solution that I see everywhere in most places, this is the same structure, by the way, um, we actually would use lookup tables. So, mm -hmm. nope, not filtering, not filtering. And everything wants to be updated right now. I'm going to skip this version. <laughs> Typical stuff. So. Um, we would go into, mm -hmm. okay, so let us go and let's do better, oh, okay, we're just reloading this. <laughs> Murphy's Law, if, every, if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. Anyways, um, let's take a look at this quote-unquote better health, so to speak. You know, there are different layers of health. No worries. Bless you. So um, over here, we could see that we have some kind of loader lookup up there. So we kind of create this dictionary, this lookup table that will be like, hey, .csv, it will be actually corresponding to the CSV loader, and so on. So we store that somewhere. And then in our main file here, we, don't, we no longer need the if, lf, lf. But actually, we just simply try to access it in the lookup, the extension. If it exists, great. And if you get some key error, then you handle some form of an exception. So OK, great, this works. But the thing is, we made the main look prettier, sure. We also managed to store everything in this format, which looks much better than if elif. But we still need to maintain this. This still means that whenever we implement a class to, load, to deal with some logic of loading some file, we still need to kind of add it here. And if we don't, it kind of crashes everything, right? So how could we make this better? But we will take a little pause from here. So we've seen these kind of common ways to deal with these problems. Let's actually move on to um, new and init subclass. So I've divided it into six little parts. And 
we could actually take a look at them from here. So first thing is we will just deal with the basic stuff. So here we've got uh, class A. It has an init. And in the main, we simply create uh, an instance of that. And then we're just checking the type of it, right? So we can imagine already what would be here. So great, I am init of A, got executed. I'm using these print statements just to let us know where we are in the code uh, at runtime. And the type is, of course, A, class A. So great, nothing really surprising over here, just basic stuff. Now we will introduce new. Now, um, new basically, think of it as something that runs even before init. We are constantly told that the first thing that runs in a class is actually the init. This is where you initialize everything. This is like, let's say, the first entry point to the to instanti uh, instantiation of a class. But in reality, it's actually new. New is what gives the class itself to init, uh, for init to run. So it defines which init should be running. Now, this might seem um, a bit confusing, but I will definitely, there will definitely be room for Q&A at the end, so feel free to ask anything else with regards to this. Now, let's, let's run this code just to see what's happening. So, as we saw, that first thing, I am new of A, which is great. Is, new is what's being called first. And please note that we have actually a class as a uh, entered to new. So it's not really just the instance, not the self, but the class itself. It needs to know which class to, impl uh, to implement, or not to implement, actually, to run the init of. So we called new first, and the class it, uh, that was given to it was actually class A, and that means that we run the init of A, and then the instance variable, this one, is actually of type A. So great, that's what's happening. Sounds amazing. Now, this is going to be the third variation. So it's actually uh, showcasing how new is doing its thing. So we've got the same thing, class A. We've got exactly the same implementation. Only difference is that we've added class B, which is going to be um, the parent of class B will be class A. So it's some kind of an implementation class. It has its own in it. But now what I'm doing here is I'm hard coding in the new to return new but with class B. So right now, note that new is returning class B, not returning class A as we saw before, which means that the expectation should be that the init of B should be run. And the type of the variable that we're creating down here is actually not A, but it's actually B. So let's see if that's going to be the case. And as we expect, it is the case. The new of A ran with the class A, but then it actually returned B, as you saw here. So it ran new on B, which means that the init of B got executed, not the init of A. So this is a very, very important like, uh, showcase of what new is doing. And I hope this kind of makes you more familiarized with it. Now, let's move to init subclass. Now, th this, one, this one is a fun one, I would say. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. yeah, something like that. Okay, now this, this one is quite uh, interesting. We've got, class, we've got class A and we've got class B, same exactly as before. So nothing, nothing changed other than we, add, we added here in its subclass. So, but just, just out of curiosity, we have here a class definition, another class definition, and in the main down here, we're putting pass, so we're doing nothing. Would, how many of you here expect nothing will happen, or nothing will be on the standard output. Raise your hand. All right, cool. It's a fair expectation, because we're actually not, not calling anything. We're not running any specific code. So that's what should be happening. Um, and I'll assume that the rest of you thought otherwise. Now, uh, I guess somehow now, welcome to Python. Actually, something does get run and executed and gets printed on the standard output. Um, this init subclass did run. Because in its subclass, it searches through the subclasses of some kind of base class. So in this case, class A is the parent or the base class. It will go through how many subclasses of A exist. And it will take this whole class as the class uh, object itself and give it 
as a parameter to this init subclass. So you can use it somehow. You might think, why is this even useful? How could this make things better? But I hope all this will tie in when we move on to solution three. So let's move on to four, um, which is when we actually do something. Uh, it might be worth it to just, OK, something like this. So over here, we are doing the same thing. But what is special is actually just we're running some code. It's no longer just pass. So the order of things, of how, how will they be executed, is what uh, the point of this particular file is. So the first thing that should load is actually the init subclass. And then we will have the new. And then we will have the init of whatever new rel uh, relayed. So this should be the sequence that we would expect based on what I showed so far. So it's exactly what happens. First thing is first. Init subclass does its thing. It was the first thing over here. And then we started to run the new of A because we're trying to initialize it in the main. And actually, we were redirecting new to class B. So the init of B got run. And I will finish this with, with simply, um, let's say, a more complex version of the exact same thing that we just did. Uh, together here, so we just added a new class, a new, a new uh, implementation class or subclass, and just to see how this is how this is working. And finally, at the very end, we're doing the same thing. We're simply trying to initialize A, so to speak. And uh, we could run this and see what we get. Now, this is another interesting thing: is that in its subclass, run twice. Because there are two subclasses, so it ran once with the argument of the first class and another time with the argument of the second class. And after init subclass finished doing what it's, what it's supposed to do, we moved then to new, but this time we were directing it to here, up here, like C instead of B, so it actually ran the init of C and so on. Um, I really hope that this, these six um, files kind of laid the groundwork of how these interact how new interacts together with, um, with init and with in, uh, init subclass, which ones go first, and how all this is happening. But now this will lead us to, finally, over here, the automated uh, solution, so to speak. How does this work? It has the same exact structure. So we still have an application.py. This is our entry point. We still have a directory called loaders carrying all the loader implementations over there. So that's great. But let's take a look at the application. How does it look like to see what's, what's kind of different? So this is the main. We will take a look at it from here. Let's go through it like line by line to see what, what's happening. And what, why is this really also useful or nice to have? First of all, I'm printing here like available loaders. This is just to kind of uh, showcase what are the loaders that are available. Now, please read this with, uh, how do you say this? Uh, leave some placeholders in your mind, because we will move on to the, we will move, I mean, into the base class in a bit. So definitely, there will be some areas that would require a bit uh, more knowledge for this. So what's really interesting is that here we get the extension of the file. And then when we want to create a loader, we simply create, uh, we call for it by calling this class loader. And we simply give it the file extension. Now, what's beautiful here is that that's how we created the loader in the application, the entry point. We just simply called this. There is no if, elif. There is no uh, dictionary that we are maintaining by hand. That's part of the magic, so to speak. And we have, we have it just ready to load whatever file extension we gave. Now, how, how did it do that? And more importantly, how did it leverage new and init subclass to do this? That's where we would take a look at the loader base class. Now we've got, as we said, the interface, very simple interface, just requires a load method. But this is the interesting one, the base class over here. So this is the piece of uh, code that we would really, really like to, to see and which would be interesting. In this loader base class, what it does is that it has this uh, class uh, variable that stores available loaders. It's a dictionary, very similar to the second solution of the of the lookup table. You know, 
and it's empty. But then in its subclass, it will go to all the classes that inherit from loader and loader interface. It will go through all of them, and it will take uh, from each class which extension does it use. So in the init subclass, it will be given an extension. And what it will do is that it will add to this empty dictionary, it will add a file extension as key and the subclass as uh, the value. So it's dynamically creating that uh, lookup table. You don't have to maintain it yourself. You don't need to think of implementing some logic about loading a file, but then also storing it in a different place manually for things to work. So it's doing that automatically. And that's the beauty of it. So that's the first thing that runs, the init subclass. So it populates this dictionary with all the available loaders that are actually implemented. And new is what's really cool. New is what makes it so powerful because in the main, we just simply said loader equals to loader. We didn't need to check what file extension. We simply have a class called loader that knows which logic to implement based on the file extension. And it's not like we are hiding the if, else, if somewhere else. It doesn't exist. It's not there. We're not hiding any dictionary that's manually maintainable. It's not anywhere there. Everything here is automated. So when we call new, it will go through. There's a try except block here. It will go ahead and search in the available loaders for this file extension. So if we get key error, that means it's not implemented. We still didn't implement a loader for this specific file type. But if it does exist, then the object over here, we will actually call new on this subclass. So this is the magic over here, is that we are making new uh, over here to return not this class loader, but actually the subclass that holds the actual implementation for loading a CSV file or DEFCON file or whatever file you would want to deal with. So this is really the area of, like, um, of magic, I would say. And um, something else that would be uh, worthy to note is that now the loaders also look slightly different. Just very, like it's a very slight difference. And let's take a look at what the difference is. Uh, Alright. So, the slight difference is literally over here. That's it. This line, line 10. So this is exactly how, the, how it gets automatically put into that lookup table, the automated lookup table that you don't have to maintain. It's because when you come and implement um, this class, for example, in here you will inherit from loader, so you're making it a subclass. And then you simply say that, okay, this class is responsible for file extension.csv. And that's all it takes. This is exactly what loader needs, this over here, is what loader needs to say that, oh, this is the class that's responsible for loading CSV files. So, and that's the only difference that there would be. So, uh, DevConf, same thing. It, this class says that the file extension I'm responsible for, and I know which logic to use to load this file, is uh, .devconf files, and so on and so forth. Um, and let's see. Uh, we, will, we will run this. Here it's uh, taking the CSV file. It's the file that's not commented out. So we will see how this looks like. Um, mm -hmm. and excuse me, because I have like a UK layout and I'm used to US layout, so it's slightly. All right. Uh, yeah, this is the output here. So first thing are these, uh, let's say, these print uh, logs out here, uh, up here. These are coming from the init subclass. So init subclass is first of all going and searching in all its subclasses. Loader is going to all the subclasses and going like, okay, so you are responsible for CSV file. You are responsible for this. You are responsible for that. And it's formulating this lookup table dynamically. And uh, I just simply put this to kind of show you the association, that it's tying devconf with the devconf loader. It's tying the CSV with the CSV loader and so on. And this is the actual dictionary, the, the dynamic lookup table, the automated one. And this is all created, not maintained by anyone. So you just simply have to worry about the implementation. And finally, we see that the, it decoded it properly, like, hello, I am inside the CSV file, because we actually are using a CSV file. Now, this um, was basically, let's say, the bread and butter of, the, of this talk. This is what it was meant to uh, showcase, that there are things out there 
that are quite interesting and that provide some really, really good um, kind of value. Because in my view is that this line of code over here is great value. Line number, well, it's supposed to be 26. Ignore it, it's like Vim stuff. But this line over here is the exact important part. I want people to go ahead and look at the entry point of whatever application that you have and simply understand what's happening through the main file and not having, not having anything hidden, which is, I would say, dirty, like if and elif, like manually maintainable um, lookup tables. This is the value that comes out of it because this loader only needs the extension. And if it, knows the, if it knows the extension, it will give you the correct loader without you needing to maintain anything manually or having to actively think of these things. So that is basically it. I believe that there are probably some areas that could be explained a bit more. But I think due to some time restraints, I would like to keep it here. And I would rather devote more time uh, to maybe any questions that may come. So this would take us to the end of the live demo. I would like to thank you for your attention. And you could also check out the repository over here. I have it up on GitHub. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So now for the Q&A. Yes. Great, yes, amazing question. So someone here asked that, um, how do we exactly run this init subclass, and how is the Python interpreter aware of these different uh, loader, let's say, files? So it needs to import them somehow. Would that be a fair assessment? And uh, the question is, how does it know that? Where is that happening? Or, Yeah, so great question, by the way. That's actually something that I wanted to tackle, but I was worried that maybe the time wouldn't uh, help with it. So. So I would like to showcase this. Um, we can see, yeah, great. So, ah, let's delete this. so it's actually happening over here. So in this in this directory of loaders, in the in it, uh, this is a very good point because you need to you need to import those modules for them to actually be detected by init subclass because Python will not look at something that you don't import. So in this init over here. This is what's being run. And um, you may know like under all, so when you do the wildcard import, we are choosing what are we actually importing. And here we are simply taking the stem of the module that we're in, and then we're going to basically list out what's in it. And if the module ends with underscore loader or base class, we are actually importing it. So that would make the import um, seen over here at the very top, uh, let me go to it. On line seven, the, uh, this is what is executed at this point because we need to import it. Does that answer your question? Yes. Great, thank you. Yes. Did you first. Mm -hmm. uh, right. No, I. First of all, could you repeat the question? Because I want to be able to rephrase it properly. Right. The question is if I tried to run it with ahead of time compilation. Um, no, I haven't. So I didn't really explore that area of it. But that would be actually an interesting thing. I would, I would really like to do that. Please. Um, okay, so first of all, I'll repeat. Um, 
your question, if I could categorize it correctly or phrase it correctly, is that why would this be um, any better than running some kind of a for loop that actually goes through the loaders and simply put them in some kind of lookup table, right? Right. So I think I, will, I would like to go back to the question that I asked you guys to take a look within yourselves, is that what kind of value can you extract out of this? And this is not meant to be like, take a look at this, this is faster, better, use this in your applications. It me it's meant to kind of like spark the, the curiosity to see what is possible and also what kind of doors does it open. Because just using new and well, also meta classes later and stuff, you can do stuff like overloading, which shouldn't exist in Python, but actually it does if you would want to do it. So this is more of a curiosity thing and uh, a fun project, let's say. And sometimes it, it may have its use cases, but that's what it's meant to serve as. So definitely you could do it that way, but then it would fall in the category of, um, if I were to go here, there's not many, so I should be there soon. But what you said exactly, it would fall over here, which is the everyday programming, which is, that's exactly the typical uh, approach, which is typical for a reason, because it's, uh, it's useful. But yeah, I, I'm mainly focused about the bridge part, to kind of get out of the comfort zone and see what is possible. Right? Are there any other questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. All right, interesting. So, so the question was, um, in, the class, in the class definition of the, of the loader, so over here, for example, so in this line, line 10, um, I believe the question is that this file extension given over here, would it be also stored in the, in the class or the instance? Uh-huh. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so the question is, could we move this file extension to not be in the class definition, but somehow uh, as a class attribute, right? As a class attribute. Um, I, didn't, I didn't experiment with that. I wonder, if that would, I wonder if that would work. I guess it should work because it's a class attribute, and in its subclass takes the whole class as its argument. So technically, you should be able to do it. Um, and I think this is mainly meant to be as a thing that you read immediately once you see the class. So the, the beauty of this is that visually, it's on the same line of the class uh, keyword. So it just pops out right that it's representing the file extension .csv. But I believe that it should work. Yeah. Thanks. Right, great question. The question is, could this be implemented in somehow a, of a plugin architecture in which people could actually contribute, right? And, right. So, yeah, could this be implemented with a plugin architecture? Um, I believe that yes, and I think it's a great way to do it because that means if whatever you're implementing, so literally take the abstract idea of this. Imagine instead of a loader, it's whatever it is that you want to do. And it has a defined, let's say, base class and the way of init subclass, how it works and all that. And you simply create your plugin and then you create the PR, and if it gets approved and actually gets there, it will automatically be part of the system, and you don't have to worry about that. So yeah, that's a great use case for it. Yes. Okay, so the question is, uh, if I would like make it more concise, the question is, can I do this without the in it, uh, init.py, right? Under yeah. that. In instead of loading everything. Um, no, there isn't a way to work around it. Actually, you can do it, but you would have to manually import in the main f uh, entry point, manually import every single uh, loader, which, is, which defeats the purpose, because then you actually are manually maintaining something. So, so yeah, the whole the whole point of uh, the whole point of this, 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 yeah, this, um, is to actually avoid this manual intervention. Any more questions?
<laughs> Thank you. All right, so that would conclude this talk. Thank you very much for attending.